Chapter Fifteen, Section Five, of J. B. Bury's *The Student's Roman Empire*, Part One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Julie Vermilion. *The Student's Roman Empire*, Part One, by John Bagnall Bury. Chapter Fifteen: The Principate of Claudius, forty-one to fifty-four A.D. Section 5. Agrippina. Death of Claudius. Messalina had fallen, and the question was, who was to be her successor? On this, the freedmen were not unanimous. Narcissus urged that Claudius should take back his second wife, Aelia Paetina, whom he had divorced. Callistus worked in behalf of Lollia Paulina, the divorced wife of the Emperor Gaius. Pallas espoused the cause of Agrippina, the emperor's niece. This remarkable woman, who inherited the ambition without the morality of her mother, had long been scheming to establish an influence over Claudius, who was very susceptible to female fascinations. She aimed at securing the empire for her son Lucius Domitius, and winning for herself such a position as had been held by Livia. It is impossible to know how far she may have been involved in the intrigues connected with the fall of Messalina, but it is probable that she has influenced the verdict of history on the career of her rival. For Agrippina published personal memoirs, in which she revealed the secret history of the palace, and it was almost certainly from these memoirs that the historian Tacitus drew his account of Messalina's wickedness. It may easily be believed that Agrippina highly coloured the story and distorted the truth. The death of her husband, Persianus, had left her free and wealthy, and she determined to marry her uncle, in spite of the Roman prejudice against such a union. Her charms, supported by the persuasions of Pallas, subdued the weak emperor, and in a few weeks after the death of Messalina, Agrippina exerted over Claudius all the influence of a wife. Before the end of the year, 48 A.D., she took the first step in the direction of elevating her son to the throne. He was then eleven years old, but she resolved that, when he came of age, he should marry Octavia, the daughter of Claudius. For this purpose it was necessary to break off the betrothal which existed between Octavia and Lucius Silanus, a great-great-grandson of Augustus. In accomplishing this, Agrippina was assisted by Vitalius, the emperor's colleague in the censorship, who bore a grudge against Silanus and was ready to ruin him. He informed Claudius that Silanus had committed incest with his sister, and the horrified emperor immediately broke off the engagement of his daughter. Silanus, who was a praetor that year, was ordered to lay down his office, and Vitalius, although no longer censor, presumed on his recent tenure of that office to remove the name of Silanus from the list of senators. When this obstacle to the future marriage of Domitius and Octavia was removed, it remained for Agrippina to smooth the way for her own union with Claudius. No precedent in Roman history could be found for marrying a brother's daughter. Such an alliance was regarded as incestuous and in all matters of religion, Claudius was punctiliously scrupulous. The censor who had just expressed his horror at the alleged incest of Silanus shrank from incurring the charge of a similar offence. But here again Vitalius came to the aid of Agrippina. He appeared in the Senate, and delivered a specious harangue in favour of the proposed marriage. The senators tumultuously applauded, and Claudius, then appearing in the Curia, caused a decree to be passed that henceforward marriages with the daughters of brothers should be valid. The fourth marriage of Claudius took place in the early days of 49 A.D., and on the wedding day, as it were to bring a curse on the event, Silanus, the betrothed of Octavia, killed himself. Another victim, who had come across the path of Agrippina, was Lollia Paulina, who had aspired to the hand of Claudius. She was accused of having consulted Chaldean astrologers concerning the imperial marriage, 
and the emperor himself spoke against her in the senate. She was banished from Italy, but Agrippina is said to have dispatched a tribune after her to put her to death. While Marcelina cared only for sensuality, Agrippina was enamoured of power. She was not content with being the emperor's wife, but wished to be his colleague. This position was designated by the title Augusta, which was conferred upon her in 50 A.D. She was the third woman who bore this title, but it meant for her, as it had meant for Livia, a share in political power, and was not merely, as it had been for Antonia, an honourable title. But Agrippina enjoyed a mark of distinction which had not been granted even to the consort of Augustus. She was the first Roman empress whose image was permitted to appear on coins during her lifetime by degree of the senate. When Claudius gave audiences to his friends, or to foreign envoys, his wife sat on a throne beside him. We have seen that she gave her name to the new colony of veterans established in the town of Diubi, as Colonia Agrippinensis. In order to secure her influence with the freedman palace, she is said to have engaged in an intrigue with him, but the court, under her rule, seems to have been distinguished by outward propriety, and certainly by stricter etiquette. Her schemes for her son's advancement rendered her a cruel stepmother to Britannicus. On the 25th of February, 50 A.D., Lucius Domitius was adopted into the Claudian gens under the name of Nero Claudius Caesar Drusus Germanicus. This was the first instance of an adoption of a son by a patrician Claudius, and the emperor was disinclined to take the step, not only on this account, but lest the prospect of Britannicus should be injured. He was overcome, however, by the example of Augustus. The advancement of Nero progressed rapidly. In the following year he was permitted to assume the toga of manhood, and by a decree of the Senate he was made Princeps Juventutis, designated to hold the consulship at the age of twenty, and he received proconsular power. These honours were sufficient to mark him out as the successor of Claudius to the Principate. But Agrippina went even further, and caused her son to be elected supra numerum into the four chief priestly colleges, the pontiffs, the augurs, the quindicum viri, and the septum viri. This was a distinction which the youthful grandsons of Augustus, Gaius and Lucius, had not received. Nero had already been betrothed to his cousin Octavia, and his adoption, whereby he became legally her brother, was not allowed to hinder the celebration of the marriage, which took place in 53 A.D. In the meantime, Britannicus, who was only a little younger than Nero, was regarded and treated as a child. Misunderstandings and estrangements were treacherously brought about between him and his father. On one occasion, when the two young princes met, and Nero saluted Britannicus by name, Britannicus saluted him as Domitius. Agrippina complained of this to the emperor, as implying contempt of Nero's adoption, and the decree of the senate. Claudius was moved by her representations to punish one of the instructors of his son by death, and others by banishment, and place him under the charge of the creatures of his stepmother. By her machinations, also, the two prefects of the Praetorian Guard, who had been adherents of Messalina, and were anxious to secure the succession of her son, were deposed and replaced by Ephraenius Burrows, was devoted to the interest of his patroness. All the officers who were attached to the cause of Britannicus were then removed. But the son of Messalina had not only a strong party in the senate, but a powerful supporter in the imperial household. This was the freedman Narcissus, who exerted all his energy and influence to weaken the power of Agrippina and keep Nero from the throne. After the marriage of Octavia, the struggle between the two parties became keener. Vitalius, who had shown his devotion to the Augusta, was threatened with a criminal prosecution. The condemnation of Tarcisius Priscus also showed the uncertainty of her position. She coveted the house and gardens of Statilius Taurus, 
a man of noble ancestry and great wealth, who had been governor of Africa. Briscus brought against him charges of extortion in his administration of that province, and of practice and magic. Torres disdained to reply, and chose to die by a voluntary death. But the senate expelled the accuser from their body, although Agrippina exerted all her power to protect him. There were other signs, too, which might alarm the empress. Claudius showed himself inclined to reinstate his son Britannicus in his proper position, and spoke of allowing him to assume the toga virilis. An ominous remark is said to have dropped from his lips, that it was his fate first to endure the offences of his wives, and afterwards to punish them. It looked as if the influence of Narcissus were likely once more to get the upper hand. Agrippina made an attempt to ruin Narcissus by ascribing to his mismanagement the failure of the tunnel of Lake Fucinus. She failed, but she soon enjoyed a triumph in the ruin of her most formidable female rival, Domitia Lepida. This lady, as a daughter of the elder Antonia and Lucius Domitius, was a grand-niece of Augustus, as a mother of Messalina, was a grandmother of Britannicus, and as a sister of Gnaeus Domitius, was a sister-in-law of Agrippina. In beauty, age, and wealth, there was not much difference between them. Both were immodest, infamous, and violent. They were rivals in their vices no less than in the gifts which fortune had given them. During the exile of Agrippina, Lepida had given home to the child Nero, and ever since had endeavoured to secure his affections by flattery and liberality, which contrasted with his mother's sternness and impatience. Lepida was charged with making attempts against the life of the empress by means of magical incantations, and with being a disturber of the public peace by maintaining gangs of turbulent slaves on the Calabrian estates. The indictment seems to have been brought before the emperor, and it was a trial of strength between Agrippina and Narcissus, who did all he could to save Lepida. But Agrippina triumphed. Lepida was sentenced to death. Yet notwithstanding this victory, and notwithstanding the fact that Claudius had been induced to make a will favourable to her son, the empress did not feel sure of her crown, and dreaded a reaction. Under these circumstances, the greatest luck that could befall her was the death of Claudius, and Claudius died October 13th, 54 A.D. It is generally believed that he was poisoned by his wife, and though we cannot say that her guilt is proved, it seems highly probable. Claudius was in his sixty-fourth year, and in declining health. His death took place when Narcissus was absent at Sinuessa, for the sake of the medicinal waters, and this coincidence supports the traditional account that there was foul play, for Narcissus suspected the designs of Agrippina. According to the received story, she employed the services of a woman named Locusta, notorious for the preparation of subtle poisons, who, according to the historian Testus, was long regarded as one of the instruments of monarchy. She compounded a curious drug which had the property of disturbing the mind without causing instant death, and it was administered to Claudius in a dish of mushrooms. But for some reason the poison failed to work, and Agrippina, fearful lest the crime should be discovered, called in her confidential physician Xenophon, who did not hesitate to pass a poisoned feather into the emperor's throat, on the plea of helping him to vomit. The position of Nero at the death of Claudius was far stronger than that of Gaius at the death of Tiberius. Nero had to fear a declaration in favour of Britannicus, as Gaius had to fear the rivalry of the son of Drusus. But Nero possessed a proconsular power, as well as other dignities, which had not been conferred on Gaius. He had also the support of his mother's influence, and above all, Burrus, the prefect of the Praetorian Guard, was devoted to his interest. Seeing that the accession of Gaius had proceeded so smoothly, there seemed no reason for doubt in the case of Nero. But Agrippina took every precaution for securing success. 
she concealed the emperor's death for some hours, and made pretexts to detain his children in the palace until her own son had been proclaimed emperor by the guards. About midday, the doors of the palace were suddenly thrown open, and Nero issued forth, accompanied by Burrus, into the presence of the cohort, which was then on duty. The prefect gave a sign, and the soldiers received him with acclamations. It was said that some hesitated and asked for Britannicus, for this demurring was only for a moment. Nero was then carried in a litter to the Praetorian camp, where he spoke a few suitable words, and was saluted Imperator. This was the second occasion on which the Praetorians created an emperor, and following the example of his father Claudius, Nero promised them a donative. The Senate did not hesitate to accept the will of the guards, and on the same day, October 13th, the Dies Imperii of Nero, decreed to him the proconsular power in its higher unlimited form, the prerogatives embodied in the Lex de Imperio, and the name Augustus. The tribunician power, which was necessary to complete the prerogatives of the princeps, was conferred upon him by Comitia on the 4th of December. The legions in the provinces received the news of the new principate without a murmur of dissent. According to custom, the Senate met to consider the acts of Claudius. He was fortunate enough to receive the honours which had fallen to the lot of the model Augustus, and which his two predecessors had missed. He was judged worthy to enter into the number of the guards, and flamens were appointed for his worship. All his acts were decreed to be valid. His funeral was ordered after the precedent of that of Augustus, and Agrippina emulated the magnificence of her great-grandmother Livia. But the will of the deceased sovereign was not read in public. It was feared that the preference shown to the stepson over Britannicus would cause unpleasant remarks. Nero pronounced the funeral oration, composed by Lucius Aeneas Seneca, over the dead emperor. One of Agrippina's first acts after her marriage with Claudius had been to recall Seneca from his exile in Corsica, and entrust to him the completion of her son's education. During his banishment he had attempted, by the arts of flattery, to get his sentence repealed, and had addressed a treatise to the freedman Polybius, into which he wrought an extravagant panegyric of the emperor. But Claudius had paid no heed, and Seneca was resolved to have his revenge. He assailed the memory of the emperor soon after his death, in an unsparing and remarkably clever satire, entitled The Apocalyptosis, Pumpkinification, a play on apotheosis, or otherwise the Ludus de Morte Claudii Caesaris. The arrival of Claudius in heaven, the surprise of the gods at seeing his strange shaking figure and hearing his indistinct babble, are described with many jests. The gods deliberate whether they should admit him, and are inclined to vote in his favour, when the divine Augustus arises and tells all the crimes and iniquities which have stained the reign of his grand-nephew. The gods agree that he deserves to be ejected from Olympus. Mercury immediately seizes him by the neck, and drags him to the place whence none return. Iluc unde negant redire quenquam. On the way to the shades, he passes through the Via Sacra, where he witnesses his own funeral, and sees the Roman people walking about as if they were free from a tyrant. When he reaches the lower regions, he is greeted with a shout, Claudius will come. He is surrounded by a large company, consisting of the victims who had perished during his reign, senators, knights, freedmen, kinsfolk. I meet friends everywhere, said Claudius. How came you hither? Do you ask, most cruel man? was the reply. Who else but thou sent us hither, murderer of all thy friends? He was then led before the tribunal of Aeacus, and prosecuted on the basis of the Lex Cornelia de Sicaris. He is condemned to play forever with a bottomless dice-box. 
This satire of Seneca, reflective of the general derision which was cast upon the deification of Claudius, the addition of this emperor's ridiculous figure to his number of the celestials, effectually dispelled that halo of divinity with which Augustus had sought to invest the Principate. End of chapter 15, section 5